Hi, folks. Thank you for joining us in the Vermont Wild Kitchen. Usually this time of year, we would be doing cooking seminars like this live. The ramps come up during the springtime and you can find them under deciduous trees and they really like that full sunlight in the spring when the leaves aren't out. This is a rear shank, so it came off one of the rear legs. Um, down here would be the, the bone that goes to the hoof and then up here the rest of the leg. This is my favorite part of any fish is the cheek. It is just tender, sweet, succulent. It's the best bite. I'll take that over a loin, a belly, a tail any day. And there's a shame there's only two of them and they're so small on a fish. Here's an example. There is this really beautiful brick red mushroom with this really gorgeous gloss and white all along the edge. What we're really trying to do here is just bring you into our kitchens and show you just how easy and just how delicious it can be to not only cook with wild ingredients, but also pair those up with the farm fresh ingredients that can be found throughout Vermont. All right, hi everybody. Thanks hi. for tuning in to the Vermont Wild Kitchen. We're so excited for you to be joining us this evening. It is certainly springtime in Vermont. I know I had a couple inches of snow yesterday, as I'm sure you did, and there's still some pockets hiding out there. But the fun part about it is that there are things popping. The trees are getting green. The ground is littered with ramps and fiddleheads are popping up and garlic mustard. And I'm so excited for our episode today. Uh, as always, for those who are tuning in for the first time, the Vermont Wild Kitchen is a collaboration between Vermont Fish and Wildlife and Rural Vermont. And really our goal here is just to showcase the abundance that is in Vermont of what we have to eat, whether that's wild um, or farmed. And we're here trying to really demonstrate just how easy it is to cook with all these delicious ingredients. Uh, today, we have a great episode uh, lined up. We have some wonderful people who are going to be showcasing a trout chowder and um, some really scrumptious sounding oatmeal cookies with, shower, um, with sour cherries. <laughs> so with that being said, uh, to get us started, please go and visit Rural Vermont and Vermont Fish and Wildlife's website, sign up for their newsletters. You can find that in the comments, some links to that. And uh, we really want to say a big thank you to King Arthur Flower, who is helping to sponsor some of these shows and really help provide mm -hmm. some stipends for our cooks who are joining us virtually in the kitchen from their homes in Vermont. So with that being said, um, if you are looking to stay informed about when our upcoming episodes are gonna be, you can sign up for our monthly updates. Again, I just dropped that link in the chat. And uh, today I'm really excited to have in the kitchen with us, Alan Morehouse, who's a fish culture specialist with Vermont Fish and Wildlife. Uh, he is gonna be showing us a pretty simple uh, trout chowder for you to cook. Uh, whether you're pulling that from the river yourself or you're trading with your friends. And we also have Carol Fairbank, who is the farmer, owner, operator of uh, Broad Fork in Greensboro, Vermont. And they are a sustainable, diversified, solar powered family farmstead. And they're really practicing regenerative agriculture and working to keep the homesteading arts alive here in Vermont. So with that being said, we are going to start off with Alan, and Alan, uh, what are you going to be cooking for us today? I am going to be making a trout chowder with asparagus. Wonderful. The fiddleheads are not up at my house yet, so I have to get some asparagus. So I That's work okay, right? Uh, yes. I work at the Salisbury Fish Culture Station, so I know a lot about trout, and, and I've been... Um, I played with this recipe earlier. It was a basic recipe and I've just been tweaking it. This is kind of adding stuff. I'm adding the vegetable. I didn't add the vegetable before. So basically it's, um, I've got two cups of diced red potatoes uh, boiling on the stove. I boil them for about three to five minutes. 
I just I don't peel potatoes in this house. I, I like the skin, so everything I'm you know when I'm cooking potatoes, mashed potatoes, whatever, I'm leaving the skin on. So it's pretty simple. So same here. Red potatoes, red potatoes like that, just diced up, and I'll show you. Honestly, I never really understood folks who peel potatoes. Yes. I get it, but why, it's, why it's, go it's through the trouble when you can just eat all that deliciousness? <laughs> so I got these covered with water, and I'm just getting a little simmer on them. They, they've been boiling, got them up to boil for about five minutes, and now I just got them simmering, and they can simmer for a long time. And with this recipe, if, if you run out of if you run out of fluid, you could add a little more water or you could add a little bit of milk or add a little bit of half and half. This is soups and stews. It's simple. Just it's just stuff cooking in, in a fluid. So the, the next thing I do is when those are cooking, I'm adding a little bit of um, my, uh, 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 two teaspoons of salt, a quarter teaspoon of black pepper and an eighth teaspoon of allspice. And that's right here. And for folks who are interested, I'm going to be putting the recipe in our chat, too. It's pretty straightforward um, and relatively easy, um, but again, super delicious. So I would highly recommend <laughs> checking it out um, and looking for it. And you said you worked at the fish hatchery, this, right, Alan? Um, for folks soldier. who are looking to find trout you know where should they be looking like maybe are there fishing clinics like what are you, what are your tips and tricks for people who we actually maybe have, have an experience with this ingredient we have fishing clinics on our uh, actually i think we have our on, on uh, we have a vermont fish and wildlife site on facebook um there's probably links just go uh, type in vermont fish and wildlife .com and it'll pull up in a, in a google search and there's there's link. I'm sure there's links. So we do like you know have a calendar of events, and we do fish, ice fishing clinics. Um, uh, Corey Hart, who's who's our, our like our Let's Go Fishing instructor, he you know he puts on clinics for various stuff, and he's involved in in, in this program as well. So mm -hmm. um, he he's the one that you know will get out complete novice fishermen. But you know we put out like right now we're stocking fish, so we put that on our website where fish are being stocked. So once they're stocked later that day. You know, you'll know where they are. So you can just, you know, look at our website and figure, hey, that's been stocked. I can go fish now. You know, so it's it's we're pretty and, much transparent on, hey, where to go fishing. We're, we have a lot of information. You just got to look for it a little bit. But usually go to Vermont Fish and Wildlife site. We actually have, you know, the old school, you know, magazine that has our fishing regulations in it. You can find that when you're buying a fishing license. And that has like tips and tricks and everything else. So and I will so say look. for folks who haven't gone trout fishing before, it is not as complicated as you might make it out to feel in your mind. It yep. is a fishing pole and a worm will do the trick if you're in a pinch and you can get as fancy with it as you want. I don't know how many times, how many lures I've lost trying to get super fancy with it though. So sometimes yep. your best bet is just to get that live bait and plop it in the water and see what you're going to pull up. Yeah. Especially some of our ponds that are stocked, you know, it's easy. You can get it out there. You don't, this river fishing can be really technical. But generally for like novices and, and, and new people fishing, just, just go pond fishing, cast. I mean, a lot of our stock trout are almost like catfish. You know, you put, you know, bait on the bottom or bait on a bobber and they're just going to come up and grab it. You know, it's, it's, but a lot of times flash, you know, I see a lot of guys who just use a, a, a shiny spinner and just throw it out there and they'll get fish following it. And once you see the fish, you start realizing they're there and then you figure out other ways to catch them if, if they're challenging. So let me, yeah. um, let me, focus, let me focus on the next step of this. I've got I've got my potatoes like like in a simmer, and then now the next step would be to add my um, main ingredients. I add butter, and I add a, a half half a cup of butter, which is also a stick of butter. So that's pretty simple. So that goes in that goes in with a can of evaporated milk. I think one of my favorite parts about the show is you get an insight into people's kitchen and their makeup. And I know, Alan, your kitchen is very set up like how mine is. You always got to be moving back and forth and you're finding your yes. stove in the odd places. But yes, the nice thing is you can always cook up something delicious easily yeah, got, with all stuff. these great ingredients. I've got a coffee bar yeah. over there. I've got the spices over there. And then, and then after, after I get the milk and the butter in, I do my next ingredients, which I'm doing uh, one large diced onion. These are 
this was a sweet onion, but you can, you know, whatever you want, yellow onions, you know. And um, then I'm doing my, my vegetable is uh, two cups of asparagus. I wanted the smaller ones, but this is they had the big ones today. But hey, it works. And but this is where if you're using, let's say you want your vegetable to be um, carrots. You put the carrots in when you do the potatoes because they're a little harder and they're going to take longer to cook. So you put them in first, you know, with the potatoes and let them cook down. You know, asparagus a little softer. And if you could use spinach, spinach is a good one for these or kale. You, you can put that in toward the end of your boil or end of your simmer because they won't need as long to cook. So these go in next. Yeah. And I would say, too, uh, you mentioned fiddleheads, which are yeah. a great, uh, easy wild edible to find uh, make sure you're harvesting sustainably of course um don't be cooking the whole plant but things like yep. nettles are popping right now which yes. are all over the place garlic <laughs> mustard would be a really good thing to add and i love this recipe so much because it really can showcase just however you want to make it and whatever tastes good to you that's the best part about this if you like corn put corn in it's not corn season <laughs> a lot of times though this becomes a, like a, a leftover recipe. I've been doing a lot of soups and usually your creamy soups are like evaporated milk, half and half butter, you know, regular milk. There's your stock. And then your, your, your other soups will be like, you know, chicken stock or vegetable stock. And then, you know, you could add beer or wine to that and then spices. And there's your, there's your regular like savory stock and you just add stuff to it. You add, you know, get a leftover roast chicken, throw pieces in there. You got some corn in the freezer, throw that in there. I've been doing that all the time and just add a can of beans and you never know what you're going to make. You know, it's it, and it just I it's love that experimentation with that. So that stuff's yeah. sitting there. Going to get that back up to up to temperature. Bring bring the the the, the milk and, and the diced onion, and the asparagus. Bring it back up to simmer because that probably chilled down. And then you let that. Then then once that comes up to temperature, I'll add my fish, which is about two cups of boneless, skinless fish. This is this is trout. This is actually steelhead trout. Um, I cut one to two, two one to two inch pieces, and um, but you can use bluegill for this you could probably use catfish i use I do a lot of bluegill um um cooking in the in the winter time i'll make stews like or soups like this you know just the small bluegill i'll keep the big ones for fish tacos or something but all the little ones i just take little slivers of pieces i put them in in, in a chowder and it works great so you know you can try whatever you want so this will go in next and folks who maybe haven't worked with fish before or whole fish that they've caught we have a lot of great tutorials through the Vermont Wild Kitchen, Vermont Fish and Wildlife, or just search it in YouTube about how to break down a fish. A lot of it is the same techniques. You got like basically two simple techniques uh, and they're pretty straightforward. And once you get some practice in, it becomes second nature. And like Alan said, you're able to use all the fish because it's another great way is to use those bones to make a stock too that you can freeze and really pull out whenever you're looking for uh, something quick to be able to make in a pinch during the evening. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's it. Pretty much that can simmer 20, 30 minutes. Um, you know, as long as you want, and, you know, if, if it gets too thick, you know, you just add a little bit of milk, you know, add some cream or whatever, just, just keep it going. And then once, once it looks good and everything's cooked, you know, to, to your, to your liking, you just, it's done and you can pair it with so, whatever you want. I have some crusty bread. Yeah. So. <laughs> there you go. So, and and you guess, can always find that locally too. Yes. You can make it yourself. Too. Uh, so with your, um, with the fish stocking program, can you talk a little bit more about that? I don't, I mean, some folks might not be familiar of why you're stocking fish. Yes. Like what's the point of, are they invasive? Like when you're putting them in the water, like where, like, I guess what's the programming behind it and the thought behind it for fish and okay, wildlife and what you're is, all doing? And it's funny you mentioned that because I went on, uh, it was today or yesterday, and our one of our biologists, Lee Samar, did a good good talk about it actually on our Facebook page. Uh, I think it's on the Fish Vermont link um, uh, where he talked about our, the, the the different, why we do what we do. But most of the stock trout in the state are for uh, for recreational fishing. Um, but so, some of what we have, basically you break down our, our trout our trout situations in the state are we have wild wild trout situations like you know upland streams like brook trout and some wild rainbow trout with some wild browns those streams won't get stocked you know if it's good habitat mm -hmm. it's producing trout it, it won't get stocked um if it, it might some of that stream might be marginal when you get further down the hill you know it might be cold enough to keep trout year round but it doesn't have reproduction but it's a good place 
or access for people to go fishing, those will get stock. And a lot of those are historically been stock. It's, it's a good, good stream for that. And then, you know, and then even further down, it might get too warm. But, you know, in a situation where it'll hold trout for a little while, it's completely, you know, habitat that won't be able to be, you know, is completely degraded, but can still hold trout for a little bit of time. You know, they'll, they'll stock trout there. You know, some of our trophy trout areas really don't hold trout throughout the winter. They'll hold them throughout the summer, but our winters are kind of rough and they just, they, they won't survive or they get too hot in the summer, but in a, in a wet year, they'll, they'll survive. So you can catch them. But yeah, generally, you know, our streams are kind of set up like that. So if, if, if it's, if it's good trout water or something we can put trout in, we'll probably put it in. But if it's not, if it's a really good bass place, we won't put, put trout there. You know, it's, they'll get, you know, it's, it's just yeah. managed it that way. And same with the lakes and ponds. We have, you know, some places that are like restoration, like Lake Champlain, we're trying to restore lake trout and salmon there, you know, and still to provide an angling opportunity, but we're trying to truly restore those species. So we don't have to stock them. We're seeing in, increased reproduction on natural reproduction, lake trout, which is really, you know, incredible because we've been trying to restore them for so many years and now it's actually working. So we might get to the point where we can really reduce stocking of those fish. And, and actually have a wild fishery for those Lakers and the same with the salmon. And some of our ponds are would be considered put grow and take where you're putting the fish in, the habitat's decent to raise the trout. It has smell and other bait fish. So therefore they eat, eat those fish and get bigger. You know, the harvest, the, the harvest size is different. So, you, you know, you put a fish in that's eight inches, but you know, you don't harvest until it's 15. Those would be a put grow and take situation where there's no natural reproduction of that fish. So you have to stock it, but it grows and then you can still harvest it. And then there's situations where just put and take fun fishing, you know, springtime, you put fish in there, you know, just catch them, you know, for a few weeks. It gets people excited about fishing again. You know, it's, it's winter's been long. And that's kind of basically how the program works in this state. So we really, you know, we calculate where we put fish. You know, we're not like just spreading them all over the place. We used to do that. You know, they used to put fish all over the place. Johnny Appleseed did them everywhere and now you know we're just you know focusing the attention okay this gets a lot of angling pressure we'll put fish here this doesn't get angling pressure we won't stock this or it has a good bass fishery you know so we won't stock there you know or good pike fishery i'm you just, want to i'm imagining you right now walking around with like a backpack full of trout johnny apple seeding the fish right um as you're walking along the banks uh, we have brenda commenting that when their parents and them lived in massachusetts she loved as a kid to eat and catch rainbow trout, which you could definitely find in Vermont. Yes. Uh, we have Matt who's asking that whether he read somewhere that the trout stocked in Vermont were sterile. Um, is that yes. true? They okay. have. Okay. Our program with that is that our brook trout, we sterilize the brook trout. They're triploid brook trout. When they're really young at a young, at, at, at an egg stage, at a certain time, you disrupt their, their, their re reproductive processes when they're, when they're, when the fish are, are basically, you know, determining their sex, and it um, it basically makes the females completely sterile, and the males will probably, you know, will be be, be sterile. Will shoot blanks. They may still produce a gonad and, and and produce sperm, but they'll be shooting blanks. And and um, so that's what we do with all our brook trout, whether it's a pond fish, because there's some pond ponds where brookies will 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 spawn in a stream. So we we, we sterilize sterilize places like that. But all the brookies are sterilized. The rainbows, any stream rainbows, are sterilized. The, the, the pond mm -hmm. fish aren't because generally there's aren't too many opportunities for a rainbow to run up out of a pond and spawn successfully. We're not doing it with the brown trout yet. I don't think it's much of a yeah. concern. Um, but yeah, we just um, do it with those, those, two, those particular fish. And it's a pretty simple process and we do it with a pressure pressure shock and it's it's not like harmful to the fish or anything like that. It just, it's, it's kind of our program now. To, to, and yeah. that preserves the genetics. You know, if we have good wild, you know, wild brookies, in these streams and these fish, we still want to stock it because the lower lower down is degraded and we can't really improve the habitat, but we still want to stock it. Those fish won't reproduce and cause you know genetic issues because some of our fish are are good hatchery fish and then the wild fish are good wild fish. So you know, it's 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 kind of the the, the, the different directions to go. <clears throat> yeah, and it's based off of the and it, right. You're basing it off of the pressure, right? And like what yes. the habitat can maintain and sustain. So. I think, and Matt, that asked, like, don't we want fertile trout? And I think the answer I'm hearing is it just depends on where you are. And a right. lot of this is yeah. for recreation for folks. Exactly. Uh, and I will say, too, um, for people who maybe haven't fished in a while, don't have the gear, this is prime time to go around to garage sales. People are having a lot of cheap gear uh, that you can find in those garage sales around. And I would also say, too, if you all have an opportunity to find 
um, and watch some of these wild trout spawning. I used to live up in the Northeast Kingdom and in Glover, it was always uh, pinnacle of the year to be able to go watch the wild salmon, uh, the wild the wild trout uh, running up the river, which was always Will spectacular to be able to go and witness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, that, that's what's in the pot right now. Those are Mephromagog steelhead. <laughs> Uh, we have, I love we, it. I miss and we have, see, we have brood, uh, that. Yep, that's a situation where we have brood stock that we do use in that river. We we have a we we did a good we did a pedigreed mating of those fish. We went out to the Willoughby gut fish that we actually um, you know did a good cross with them and brought those fish back to the hatchery to just to supplement that particular run. So we get a good consistent run of fish. So we actually have the Willoughby River steelhead, which are, are, are a good strain of of fish. That will return and spawn. We don't sterilize these. They will return and spawn, and they're you know it's successful. It's you know it's just like our lake trout. We, we have our lakers in Lake Champlain, which are our stock product, but they're producing eggs. They're actually su surviving. So there's something good in those fish. So that's kind of where that's we amazing. have. You know, it's it's you never know what you get. You know, with, with some of these fish, you got to you know. And yeah. years ago, the old fish. So a lot of our, our our fish, like the rainbows and browns that are wild, were originally stock fish. They weren't here naturally. They were Johnny Appleseeded. The stocks survived. Some of those stocks did survive. They were probably closer to a wild fish because those eggs were coming from, you know, Washington and some from Europe. Those are coming out of probably being collected from a wild fish in streamside and then shipped here. We dumped them in a river and they survived because they were closer That's to a wild fish. You know, wonderful. So. And I am dropping in the chat right now. Uh, Fish and Wildlife did release new regulations around fishing. So if you are getting yes. out there, make sure to check them out. Very simplified. You don't have 17 million tables that you're right. trying to sort through anymore, um, which is wonderful. And Alan, while your chowder is simmering on the stove, I am going to toss this over to Carol. And Carol, we're so excited to have you in the Vermont Wild Kitchen today. And can you tell us a little bit uh, about what you're going to be cooking, who you are, and what you're doing up in Greensboro? Yeah, of course. Thanks so much, Shane, for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here in my little kitchen on this rainy day in the spring. Um, so today I'm going to be making a recipe that comes from one of my favorite, um, well, it's a cookbook and a book of essays. and. Um, I, it's, it's delightful. It's just a great book, um, called the feast nearby by Robin Mather. Um, we should be able to share a link to that book. If anybody wants to look Putting for that it. in right now. Yep. Perfect. This recipe is on page 61. Um, and I just, I love it. It is such a departure from a traditional oatmeal raisin cookie that it, it's almost like you're not even eating the same thing. I just love it. So we're going to be using, instead of raisins, we're going to be using some of these beautiful dried um, tart cherries that I grew here on the farm. And Yum. they um, they're from the 2021 harvest. And you can see, I'll try to hold one up here. You can see that they're very soft and pliable and kind of sticky. Um, and the way I preserve these is I use an Excalibur food dehydrator. And they go in the dehydrator until they're pretty dry. And then um, to kind of let them absorb some ambient moisture back from the air again, will give them this kind of chewy texture. Um, mm. I know a lot of folks dry, you know, I keep hearing people tell me in classes, every time I dry something, it comes out really crunchy, like hard as a rock or like potato chips. Um, and that is you know, you, you might have taken it a little too far, and that does not mean that it's it's ruined. It just means that if you let it sit on the trays without the dehydrator running for a little while, um, especially if it's a little humid in the summertime or if it's been raining, you'll pull some of that moisture back in and you'll end up with this, this just gorgeous, leathery kind of pliable product that is very much like a raisin or a piece of candy or something you can just pop out of hand. So we're going to use the... What? A great tip. And I would imagine, too, that tip could be used for so many things that we're finding, uh, whether you're growing or whether you're finding um, fruits while you're out walking through the woods, too, um, during any time of the season. Absolutely. And there are so many different fruits that grow wild that you can do the same thing with. Um, I've collected uh, Concord-type grapes. 
bit south from where I live to be able to find them, but um, they're, you know, they're all over central to southern Vermont. Um, any of the raspberry, blackberry family works well the same way. And the trick is just to not make them too dry. If they're too dry, then they become a little bit unpalatable. You just notice the seeds a lot. Um, but these are just, I pit them and I dry them and they come out great. So, and folks too, uh, sorry, Carrie, I just want to let folks know, I just dropped a link into uh, the chat for Broad Fork, Far Broad Fork, where what Carol is the owner, operator, farmer, and I would highly suggest that you all take a chance and go follow them on social media too. So I'm putting the Facebook link and the Instagram as well. Uh, so you can follow along with the adventure. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure that people knew before you you dive you dove in. Yeah, thanks for that. And um, just a, a tiny bit of background. Um, I operate as a Vermont LC3. Um, so I'm not a nonprofit and I'm not a fully for-profit business. And it's really because Broad Fork is a mission-driven organization. So we're here to not just grow food for our family and for the community, but also to um, really promote that kind of a model. There's a lot of... Um, really amazing things that we're doing on our farm that are very repeatable, you know, that can be done across Vermont to really help us feed ourselves versus relying on this big industrialized food system. Um, and people Definitely. are always surprised by how much food and how, you know, how diverse the things that we produce on this farm are. Um, growing in this little place in the Northeast Kingdom where we have such a short growing season, we have so much abundance. And I think um, being able to share that and teach people how to do that and really just um, focus on increasing our, I think our community's food equity, that's a really big thing um, that we really try to work on as well. So that's kind of the mission behind it. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're having a lot of fun growing things, baking, making preserves, you know, selling at farmer's markets. Um, and we do farm stays here as well. So it's, um, it's a lot of fun, but we really do have a good, we have, we have good intentions behind it. And I feel like we're really being successful with delivering that. Um, That's so, amazing. I love hearing that, that story too. And why it fits so perfectly into this show, food accessibility and equity right there with farmed and wild foods and how we're making sure that people can um, stay fed and eat the foods that they're also looking for and want to be eating too. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so we'll start on the recipe. And I am going to, um, I'm going to use a KitchenAid today because otherwise it'll take us a really long time and a lot of, you know, huff, huff whipping over here of trying to get this <laughs> point. Um, so we're going to start with two sticks of butter because these are cookies. They have a lot of um, fat in them, which is awesome. And into the two sticks of butter, I am going to put some, um, you can use white sugar or you can use um, any other kind of, um, if you use an organic sugar. This is the sugar that I buy for making preserves, so it is a white sugar. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and put that in the KitchenAid. I'm using this paddle attachment. Um, you can use the whisk attachment too. Um, it, mine is very noisy, so I'm going to go with this one. Uh, and we're going to give this, this is going to get noisy for a second, but we're going to give it maybe 30 seconds or so. And while that is going, I'm putting the recipe for these delicious cookies in the chat as well. So you all can follow along and, and cook along with Carol at some point too. Increasing the speed on this because we're creaming butter and sugar. Right now. <laughs> Honestly, so I started. I was I was always like a little hesitant about the kitchen aids, and we just got one like into our kitchen, and it revolutionized my baking and bread making. I was like, all right, I guess I don't need to do all of this by hand anymore. <laughs> I've had mine for twenty five years, and I can't imagine not having it. Um, it's just, it's, oh it's such part of my kitchen. So now we're going to add some eggs and I wanted to share our beautiful eggs. We have right now, our chickens are all laying our 
goose. We have a goose who lays this giant egg. Um, and we have some guineas and they lay this tiny little brown egg. So today we're going to use two large eggs. Um, so I'm just going to choose these regular old run of the mill chicken eggs like this. And folks, you can find eggs just about anywhere in Vermont. I know you all have neighbors. Um, you either have chickens in your backyard. Uh, you know your farmer that's growing some really delicious eggs too. Uh, so a lot of these ingredients you can very clearly get uh, sourced here right in Vermont, which is which is a wonderful thing to do. Melissa says, I, I'm guessing with relation to Alan, Melissa says, oh, yeah, Melissa says uh, the goose egg looks magical, which I can confirm that I agree with that assessment. So we just got our geese recently, like less than a week ago, um, and I got the first egg the other day and I made, um, I used one egg to make two batches of pancakes, which would have been two to three eggs. And they <laughs> fluffy pancakes I have ever had in my life. They were enormously thick and fluffy and gosh, I, I will probably never make pancakes with anything else if I have a goose egg on hand. Mm. Wow. Do you okay. find um, any difference between the chicken, the goose and the guinea eggs as you, I mean, you're just describing really fluffy pancakes, but have you been using them in other projects as well? So I'm new to the goose eggs, um, so I can't really give much of a, a report yet. But um, we also have ducks, and the duck eggs, I notice, give a little bit more loft um, in baked goods, so they do make it fluffy. Um, but I personally think ducks have kind of a, their eggs have a little bit of a swampy taste to me, <laughs> which I know so <laughs> I love it. You know, it's a lot of people will say, oh, but they're so much more flavorful and delicious. And if you like it, that's great. I just don't like them like... Um, you know, like over easy in a pan or something. They need to be in something for me. Right. But the goose egg, I love yeah. it. Didn't have much. Um, I didn't notice that. So baking soda. <laughs> soda into all of it, so we don't have any chunks. Um, and then I'm going to put a teaspoon of vanilla extract. And this vanilla extract is, um, this is a homemade one. It's just made with some high proof rum and some grade B vanilla beans. They do the best for if you're trying to make your own homemade vanilla extract. So I'm going to put a teaspoon. And folks, make your own homemade vanilla extract. You will never have to buy the expensive stuff from the grocery store ever again. And it is delicious and easy. So much better. It's just so good. All right. So now I have milk, um, vanilla, and a little bit of um, baking soda. And I'm going to put that in here. And I'm going to mix again. We got a lot of love coming in for the Kitchen Aid. Uh, it's being described as a game changer. Uh, where, what else? I, I don't see all the comments coming in, but. There's a lot of love out there for the for the not doing this all by hand. So I'm glad to be on the team finally. Okay. All right. So now we're going to do a separate bowl because we're going to mix our dry ingredients together. So I'm going to start with two cups of flour. And this is King Arthur all-purpose flour that I'm using here. Um, you could do uh, a whole wheat or a half and half partial whole wheat if you wanted to. Um, I've even done it with a little bit of, um, up the hill from me is Thornhill rye. Um, the Thornhill farm grows some grains and their rye is, is just gorgeous. So um, I'll occasionally use some of that in this recipe. It comes out beautiful. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put those cherries into the flour. We've got about a cup of cherries here. And then we want those cherries to um, get a little bit coated in the flour and that helps distribute them a little bit better throughout the cookie. So I'm going to mix that. And then I'm going to add a half a teaspoon of salt. And then I'm going to grate in about a half a teaspoon of nutmeg. And um, again, this is a place where if you can get um, whole nutmegs, you can grate them on any kind of a, um, 
you know, the fine side of a cheese grater, or um, I use a microplane. This is a great tool mm. that you're investing your um, lemons or, um, you know, certainly grating your spices like this works really well. So I'm just going to do about a half a teaspoon and I'm going to do it by eye. And I don't mind if it's a little bit more because I am a lover of nutmeg. I just think it's wonderful. So there we go. Got that. Um, okay. And so now all of our dry ingredients, I'm going to mix them up. And then I've got here two cups of rolled oats. And um, these oats were grown in southern Quebec, so they're quite local. Um, you can also get oats sometimes from Glover right here in Vermont as well from the Morning Star um, Meadows Farm. They grow some oats up there. So I do try to um, buy local oats as often as possible. Um, so these guys are, are pretty local. They're less than 100 miles. I love it. And this is a great, this type of recipe, mixing the dry ingredients is great to do with kids. Uh, if you're trying to get children or your family into the kitchen too, you can always uh, assign some of these tasks out uh, that makes it fun and gets everybody involved. And again, I'm just always thoroughly impressed with really just how much actually grows in Vermont, what we can be sourcing for our kitchens, whether that is cultivated or wild. But we really do have an abundance of food here, especially as the weather starts turning and we thaw ourselves out from the long winters that we experience. Oh, thank goodness. I am ready for that. Um, <laughs> Me too. I, I almost cried a little bit uh, uh, this week when it snowed. <laughs> <laughs> this one just did feel a little longer. Okay, so all of our dries are mixed, and I just took a spatula and I went down um, the sides of this KitchenAid bowl to make sure that all of our um, all of our ingredients are you know in the bowl and not stuck on the sides. So now I'm just going to go ahead and pour that in and then this will be a really quick mix okay with this mix we want to go just until it's incorporated um, and the reason for that is because um, the more we mix and the more we handle flour a wheat flour um, we end up building up the gluten and gluten makes things chewy. So we like chewy, um, you know, when it's bread and stuff like that, which is why we handle it so much and we need it. But with cookies, we want them to be kind of light. I just realized that I'm trying the oven on. Let's do that. Um, oven should be at 350 when you start making. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we've got um, all of our ingredients are just incorporated and i'll show you what that looks like in the in the bowl it's a very stiff dough mm -hmm. so we're going to um basically take this and lose this part right here we're going to lose our pad and i am going to use a scoop and we're going to start basically lining these cookies up on our pan and um i use a small Okay, so let's see a side too. So when you make these, um, you can either um, grease your pan a little bit or you can line it with parchment. Um, I've got these ancient sill pats. So I use sill pats usually when I make cookies because I don't have to use parchment. Um, but I do, I love parchment. I'll also use the parchment, especially if I want a really crispy bottom on a cookie because the sill pat, yeah. beans, it reduces a little bit of the heat that comes up through the pan. Um, but for these, we want them chewy. So the sill pat works really nicely. Basically all I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and this is a very small scoop. It holds about a tablespoon. So we're going to drop these Perfect. by tablespoon onto our pan and I, uh, I can make a grid of about four by five Butter. and what type of uh what type of classes are you offering through 
broad fork usually throughout the year as you're scooping these cookies. It's making me think, and you have such a calm presentation. I'm like, I really would love to get up to Greensboro um, and see what you're doing as well. Oh yeah, that's great. So, um, so I teach, I teach in a few different venues. I teach here, um, usually free classes or as work study days. Um, so you can come up when I'm hosting one of those. If I do have one, I'll put it on social media. Usually. Um, I also teach through a couple of different, um, local organizations that are again, you know, promoting food independence and helping folks learn how to do things. Um, I usually do a cheese making class at the farmer's market and hard work over the summer. Um, oh. and I teach this through the grow your own, um, network, which is also a local, it's actually put on by the center for an ag economy. Um, and the Hardwick Area Food Pantry and the Rural Arts Collaborative. They kind of put together a little team to be able to help folks um, learn better about how to, you know, feed themselves, not just with like food pantry stuff, but what they can find locally. And we do a lot of foraging classes and, you know, wild crafting and um, everything from teaching folks how to garden and plant their um you know, their spring seed starting and stuff like that up to putting the garden to bed. And um, I've done classes on um, on root cellaring, even without a root cellar, if you don't have one, how can we preserve our harvest over the winter? Um, you know, and that can be anything from finding a nice cold unheated closet in your house to, you know, going all out and doing, um, you know, canning and preserving and fermenting and stuff like that. So I do all of those classes throughout the year. Um, and I do, I try to put them on my website and on my uh, social media when I can. Amazing. And, you know, you clearly are so dedicated. Oh, look how beautiful those look. And so simple. I mean, you look at the ingredients, you look how simple that was to throw those together. And it's something that's going to be super delicious. And, you know, before we throw it back over to Alan and the chowder, I'd be love to hear, you know, you're so dedicated to this. You're teaching people. Why is this way of growing food, raising animals, and really focusing in on folks' ability to, I think, participate in the food system like this so important to you? What, what really gets you going to continue doing all this great work? You know, it's, um, I, I think a big part of it is, is um, before I lived in a rural area, um, I was in a Boston suburb. You know, I grew up in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, I consider myself kind of a first generation farmer because obviously two generations, three generations ago, everybody was a farmer. But um, my yeah. mother and father were both, you know, suburban moms that like lived on postage stamp yards and we didn't really grow much of anything. Um, and, you know, I didn't know much about like, where does my food come from or how is this produced or um, why is there a purple stamp on the meat when I get it at the grocery store and, you know, things like that, or, you know, kind of, um, they're just there. You don't really think too much about it. And then when I, I started learning, um, preserving. That was where I really got my start was baking and preserving um, when I still lived in the in the Boston suburbs. And I got really interested in, um, you know, learning more about where this, you know, where, where does this come from? And, um, you know, how do these older generations feed themselves? And when I started learning that it's really not, you know, it's not rocket science, it's not that difficult. Um, I, with my, I have two adult sons that live with me that, you know, help to some extent, but I'm able to run this farmstead almost entirely on my own. Um, and wow. I do get out of the, out of the home and I teach and everything else. So I just think about it. And, and to me, it became kind of a route to having a more simple life that was a lot more intentional of, you know, supporting myself and feeding myself and feeding my family. Um, you know, not only things that are local, but really the best quality stuff, because I know what I'm putting on that soil. 
Um, and I know how I'm growing those animals and raising them and how humanely they were treated and everything. So for me, it was really, it started off as a very selfish endeavor. And then it occurred to me that everybody needs to, we don't have to go to the grocery store. Mm. Um, food that doesn't have any connection to ourselves. Um, so I think it's really, a, a, the answer is mindfulness. I think really just knowing mm -hmm having that very direct connection to where everything comes from. And if I'm not growing it myself, I want to know who grew it. I want to know where it came from. Even the salt I buy, I want the story of the people who harvest it and where it comes from. So to me, yeah. I think that's really exciting. Yeah. And I love that you, you use, you use the phrase, like it's not rocket science. Right. And I think for a lot of folks, it can seem like that. We have been so far removed oftentimes just picking up what's on the shelves in the grocery store, but whether it's wild food, whether it is uh, growing your own, there really are all the resources out there. And as you get more connected, you just become more in tune with it. You start to learn your own ways. Uh, so I just love, I love hearing that, that story and that journey that you're on uh, to be able to get there. And I'm hoping folks can see, like you don't have to do everything all at once either. You can just yeah. pick up little things that you want to start to incorporate and, you got to live your life as best as you can. And this is a fun way to get involved in an ultimately delicious way to really connect back to, to our land. And, and the thing, the, the last thing I do want to mention is you don't have to grow it. Um, and I think a lot of people think, well, you know, I, I'm not farming, I'm not growing anything. Go and get it from the farmer's market, go get it from the farm stands and the farms here when it's in season. Mm -hmm. What you have, even though you've produced it, you know, I mean, you haven't produced it, you've purchased it and you've brought it home and done whatever you're going to do to preserve it for the winter. You're still getting such a more superior product than like the strawberries that I buy in the grocery store in February are just not anything like the ones that have gone into the preserves that I make or the freezer um, or even dry. Yeah. So you don't have to yeah. grow it. Get it locally, get it when it's at its peak, and you'll love what you uh, end up with. So I'm going to throw these yeah. in the oven, and we can go see how okay. our Yeah, how long are you going to put those in for, Carol? I'm going to put them in for about 18 minutes, um, but you can, if we need to pop back sooner, that's fine, because I do have a ready pan. We have the TV magic happening. All right, mm. Alan, we're going to throw it back to you. How's the chowder doing? Great, but I'm just going to say something to Carol. That was just a wonderful, wonderful thing to hear. And just so you know, I'm from Newton, Massachusetts. I've been up here since 1996. And actually, the last couple of years, I've been supporting a, a, a farm. I've been getting a farm CSA down in Middlebury, East at Elmer Farm. And I literally, I think last year, you know, they opened up a Pick Your Own. And I pretty much from like June until, well, I was December, it was mid-December, from June to December, I think the only produce I bought at the market at Hannaford's was apples, bananas, and avocados. So if we can figure out how to grow those and, you know, or I shouldn't say the apple, like, yeah, like, well, apples we got, but that was it. You know, you know, it's like the bananas and avocados are the two things. It's like, figure out how to grow those and I'd be set. I mean, I got stuff yeah. pickles right now. I was trying to figure out how to put pickles in this. You know, I got dilly beans and you name it. You know, I they grow radishes. I'm going to pickle radishes. I made beautiful, like a pickled radish that I loved. Yeah. And they, you know, and they get this big. I'm going to pickle things this big. I, I don't know. care. You know, it's, it's like they're just sitting there. So this chowder looks awesome. So I'm going to get one set up here. Awesome. I bet you wouldn't trade the green line for the mud season any day of the week, though, right? I'd right. to be here. <laughs> Very, very true. So that has been on, I mean, I would say about 15, 20 minutes or so simmering away. Uh, yeah, your, it's, your it's, it's, it looks, it looks in amazing. And she says she could smell the good cooking from her secret location upstairs. So you're doing something right. Yeah. A little bit of Old Bay. Can always add more. Alan and, Alan and Carol yeah. and I were talking and I have a deep, deep love for Old Bay. So I'm always excited when it shows up on the Vermont Wild Kitchen. 
See if I can do this without Look at that. It. Yeah. That's amazing. And it's chunky. It's got it's 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 pretty chunky. It's, it's still say chunky. And again, folks, just how simple that chowder recipe was, right? Yep. You got your fish, your veggies, uh, uh, you got yeah, a couple cool. of ingredients. And ten ingredients. You're good to ten go. Ingredients. That's it. Ten yeah, ingredients. That's amazing. And Carol, you know, as we finish up, I would love to see how are your cookies going to show up in 18 minutes from now. Okay. So here's the TV magic cookies. I made nice. these. Um, and this is Look how they. That. And I'll show you. They've got a nice crispy bottom on them, but they're also very tender and they're just full of these beautiful cherries. Um, definitely my favorite. <clears throat> and I wanted to mention, um, I will be at the Montpelier Farmer's Market on Saturday. And if you happen to catch this show before Saturday and you wanted to pop by and say hello, um, mention the show and you can try out some of these cookies. I'll bring them to be giving them away on Saturday. I'll be there, I think, from 11 to 1. So pop I by. I love it. My failure and have a cookie. Amazing. Well, Carol, Alan, this has been a wonderful hour of the Vermont Wild Kitchen. I cannot say thank you enough for both of you all being here, for showing off some really simple, easy ways to just get in your kitchen, get your hands into these wonderful, beautiful ingredients that we're finding. And for folks, again, if you're interested in learning more, Fish and Wildlife has a lot of great clinics around fishing and hunting. Uh, you can check out um, <coughs> folks like Carol are teaching how to preserve, ferment, um, and honestly, anybody that you ask in the States that's involved with food, I guarantee you more than likely will be like, would love to talk your ear off about it because we know that people are passionate about it. Um, as I said, we do this show because we want to show you how easy and accessible these ingredients can be. We want you to get out there and experience it yourself. And you don't have to go all in all the whole way. You can just take little parts of it and start to explore some of this beautiful landscape that we know and love here. So with, without further ado, please feel free to share your stories using VT Wild Kitchen hashtag on Instagram. Uh, you can tune in and follow our Facebook page along with the YouTube channel. And uh, next month we are gonna be coming in on May 19th at 5 p.m. We're still getting the show worked out, but I promise you it's gonna be a good one. And uh, Carol, Alan, do you have anything you want to close with? Just just stay healthy and, and enjoy your supper. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, folks. Well, thank you for joining us in the Vermont Wild Kitchen, and we will see you again in a month.